Hi, I'm Steve. I'll be presenting our paper titled A Theory of Universal Learning. This is joint work with Olivier Bousquet, Shai Moran, Ramon Benhandel, and Amir Yudayoff. Uh, as machine learning is becoming increasingly important in all our lives, a key property of learning algorithms to understand is their ability to generalize beyond their training data. So the learned classifier predicts accurately on future examples as well. These kinds of generalization guarantees are important, partly because they give quantitative guarantees on how much data is needed, uh, but also partly because they motivate algorithm design. Um, the classic theoretical framework for studying generalization is the PAC model. However, as we'll see, there are important aspects of generalization not captured by the PAC model. Uh, we discuss in this work an alternative framework to the PAC models, specifically something called universal rates uh, that I'll define in a moment. Um, for instance, as we'll see, sometimes it's possible to get even an exponential convergence rate uh, on the error rate in this universal rates framework, uh, while the PAC model would never predict better than a one over n rate. Um, plus, once we have this framework capable of expressing exponential rates, we can then design new learning algorithms to fully exploit this possibility. As we'll see, this also gives rise to a rich mathematical and algorithmic landscape. So let me begin by defining the statistical learning setting, broadly speaking. Um, so a, a learning problem is defined by a distribution on XY pairs, where X is in some space and Y is a binary label. So for instance, the space X might be all possible images and the marginal distribution on X might essentially represent, say, all the images that are uploaded to Yelp, past, present, and future. Um, and maybe the label has an interpretation of one for hot dog and zero for not hot dog. Um, so then we have a notion of a learning algorithm. A learning algorithm takes as input a data set, uh, sometimes called a training set. And uh, we think of this as being sampled IID from the distribution. Um, and then the algorithm outputs a classifier. Uh, and this is just a function that maps points X to labels Y. Uh, we're interested uh, not just in fitting the training sample well, but also generalizing to the rest of the distribution, or in other words, having good prediction accuracy on future samples from the distribution. Um, quantitatively, we define the error rate as the probability of making a mistake on a fresh sample XY from the distribution P. And we're interested in achieving a small value of the error rate. Uh, now, for this to be possible, we know we'll need some kind of assumption. Uh, and for this, we introduce the notion of a concept class H, uh, which is uh, just some set of classifiers. Uh, so for example, um, this could be uh, all of the neural network classifiers with a given architecture, just to give an example. Um, but for whatever uh, set of, uh, whatever classifiers are in the class H, uh, we'll make an assumption that the distribution P is realizable with respect to H, meaning that there are classifiers in H achieving error rates arbitrarily close to zero. Okay, so uh, then in this work, we're interested in bounding the expected error rate and uh, the rate of convergence of the expected error rate. Um, now the classical theory focuses on what's called minimax analysis or uniform rates. And in com computer science, this is usually called the PAC model for probably approximately correct. Um, and the uh, PAC model has a, a very clean and concise statement of the optimal rate of convergence. It says that uh, for the optimal PAC learning algorithm, in the worst case over all distributions, all realizable distributions, its expected error rate is proportional to one over the sample size times a complexity measure called the VC dimension, named after Vapnik and Chervenenkis, who are the fathers of this whole field. Um, this is called a uniform rate because it gives a bound that holds simultaneously for all realizable distributions. Now, based on this result, uh, we can see there's a fundamental dichotomy in PAC learning. If the VC dimension is finite, the optimal rate of convergence is one over N, and we say the class H is learnable. Uh, otherwise, if the VC dimension is infinite, uh, the 
error bound doesn't converge and we say the class H is not learnable. Uh, so that's a nice simple picture of generalization. Um, and while it gives a, a very clean picture of learnability, it turns out it's really missing a lot of the bigger picture of generalization. So one thing that's been observed empirically is that sometimes learning algorithms are in fact getting faster than one over n rates. And in fact, sometimes even exponential rates. Um, so that's not, that doesn't quite fit into the picture of the PEC model. And, um, and another thing that's missing is that even with infinite VC dimension, there are learning algorithms that have expected error rate converging to zero. And in fact, there's a property called universal consistency, where even when the concept class is the set of all measurable functions, which definitely has infinite VC dimension, um, there are still some learning algorithms that have expected error rate converging to zero uh, for all realizable distributions. So for instance, the nearest neighbor classifier satisfies this in finite dimensional metric spaces. So these observations lead to a distinction between two types of convergence, uh, namely uniform versus universal. Um, to formalize this, recall that a learning problem uh, is a distribution P, and while a uniform rate would study the convergence rate of the max expected error rate, um, here we'll study uh, what rate the expected error converges at for all distributions P. So it's replacing a max with a for all. Uh, to make that totally formal, we'll say a concept class H is learnable at rate R if there is an algorithm such that for all realizable distributions, there exist constants, which may depend on the distribution, such that the expected error rate is bounded by a constant times R of a constant times the sample size. And uh, given this definition, what we find in this work is that there's actually a fundamental trichotomy of optimal rates. Specifically, we can show that for every class H, one of these must hold. H can be learnable with optimal rate that is exponential. H can be learnable with optimal rate that is one over N, or H can, be, can require arbitrarily slow rates, meaning there is no rate R that satisfies this definition. Um, we'll also give a complete characterization of which classes fit into which category. Um, specifically, we'll define two combinatorial structures that um, uh, such that which category a given concept class falls into is completely determined by whether the corresponding structure can be witnessed by that class. The first structure is called a little stone tree, uh, which is actually a well-known structure in its finite version. Um, and the second is a new structure we defined called a VCL tree. Uh, we'll show a given class is learnable at an exponential rate if and only if it has no infinite little stone tree. And a class is learnable at a linear rate if and only if it has no infinite VCL tree. Okay, so we'll start by discussing the exponential rates. Uh, what we find is that, um, as I mentioned, whether or not a, a given class H is learnable at an exponential rate is completely determined by whether or not a particular structure can be witnessed by the class. So specifically, uh, it's called a little stone tree and I'll try to define it clearly just using the picture. So uh, imagine we construct this infinite binary tree where the nodes are labeled by points X from the space and each edge is labeled with its parent nodes point X along with a binary classification, zero for a left branch or one for a right branch. Uh, then we'll say a class H has an infinite little stone tree if one can construct an infinite tree of this type such that for every finite depth path, there's a classifier in H correct on all the edges along that path. So that's the definition. Um, what we show is that any given class H is learnable at an exponential rate if and only if it has no infinite little stone tree. 
And otherwise, if it has an infinite little stone tree, then it's learnable at rates no faster than one over n. Okay, so that's part of the trichotomy of optimal universal rates. And I'll say that in the paper, we also give many interesting examples of concept classes uh, for the three different cases in the trichotomy, uh, but I'll, I'll just refer you to the paper for some, there's some nice examples in there. But now I'll, I'll give a fairly brief sketch of the key components of the proof of exponential rates for the general case where there's no infinite little stone tree. Uh, so the core component of the algorithm comes from infinite sequential game theory, something called a Gale-Stewart game. Um, and this will lead us to an interesting universal version of Littlestone's online, online learning framework. And um, uh, then we have to combine this with some statistical techniques to finally get the, the exponential rates. Okay, so the first component is Gale-Stewart games. The basic idea is that there are two players, say A and B, and they alternate taking turns in a game where uh, each player can see all the past moves of, of both players. Uh, so think of it uh, like chess, for instance. Um, and the winner is determined as a function of the infinite playout, the infinite sequence of alternating moves. Um, so then the key fact we'll rely on is the following. So if, if you suppose the winning playouts of one of the players, let's say player B, are always witnessed by some finite prefix. So if B will eventually win, then there's some finite time where it's clear that B is going to win. Um, then the key observation is that if that's the case, then provably one of the players must have a winning strategy, meaning they, they have a strategy that always wins. Uh, this is actually not that hard to show. It's essentially due to one of the player's uh, winning sequences being a closed set. But basically, we're, we're going to use this fact as the basis for a learning algorithm. Okay, so we're going to formulate a particular scale Stewart game. Um, in this game, on each round, uh, player A proposes a point xi in the instance space, and player B proposes a binary label yi. Um, then to specify who wins, we'll say player B wins if there is some finite time at which there are no concepts in the concept class that label all the previous xi points as their respective yi label. In other words, there are no classifiers in the class correct on the entire data set constructed up to time t for some finite t. Um, and otherwise, if that never happens, then we'll say player A wins. Notice that uh, by construction, B's winning sequences are always determined by a finite prefix. So we know one of the players must have a winning strategy. But if A has a winning strategy, it's not hard to see we could use it to generate an infinite little stone tree. Right, because uh, A can find a point X1 such that no matter what label B proposes, uh, there are classifiers that are correct on that label, and uh, A can then find another point such that no matter what label B proposes, and so on, and then generate an infinite tree in that way. Um, so then if the class H does not have an infinite little stone tree, then it must be the case that B has a winning strategy. Good, so we're gonna use this to make a learning algorithm. Um, okay, first, just a little notation. Uh, given a finite sequence S of XY pairs from M rounds of this game, uh, let's let G sub S of X be a function representing what binary label B would propose uh, next if A were to propose X on its next turn. Okay, um, so then if player B were using this G function to pick its moves, um, uh, and then no matter what sequence of X size uh, player A chooses, there will always be a finite time at which all the classifiers in H have been contradicted. Um, so then we can use this actually to get an online learning algorithm that has a, a nice guarantee. It guarantees a finite number of mistakes in the learning problem. 
so specifically, so now consider the learning problem. So there's a sequence of XY pairs um, and, uh, and we'll suppose it's a realizable sequence of XY pairs. And we, the, the algorithm will maintain a set S representing a play out of the Gale Stewart game to a finite number of steps. And on each round, the learning algorithm predicts the label using the opposite of what player B would propose if that X were, so, so you see the next X, and if that X were the next play by A, what would player B do? And, and we flip that label, we take the opposite of that, and that's our prediction. And then notice if, if that prediction is wrong, if that's a mistake, then it must agree with what player B would do. So we can actually take that X and that Y and um, add it to the set S. Essentially, we've advanced the game by one round so that we've added one more um, point where A made a move and then B made the move that B would make using its winning strategy. Um, so, right, so in other words, it, in other words, on every round, either we don't make a mistake or we make a mistake, but we get to advance the game. Um, we know that if we keep advancing the game, eventually there will be no classifiers left in the class that are correct on the set S. But that can't happen if the data sequence is realizable. So on any realizable data sequence, this learning algorithm will make uh, a finite number of mistakes. Um, so this essentially represents a non-uniform version of Little Stone's mistake-bound theory. Okay, um, now still need a little bit more work to convert this into uh, a result about exponential rates. Um, so recall what, we're, what we want is that the expected error rate converges exponentially. And for this, uh, notice it suffices to just show that the error rate is equal zero with a probability one minus an exponentially small uh, quantity. So, um, so that's what we're going to aim for. Now, the first thought for achieving this would be just run the, the finite mistake algorithm from the previous slide, uh, since it will indeed eventually have zero error um, after some finite number of rounds. This doesn't quite work. This doesn't quite give us the exponential expected error rates because uh, we don't have we don't we don't have control over the distribution of how long it takes for this finite time to be reached. So instead, what we'll do is we'll use a technique where we we split the data into batches and run the algorithm on each batch, and then the final predictor will be a majority vote among those classifiers. Um, this effectively only relies on a quantile of how long it takes the algorithm to stop making mistakes rather than its mean. Um, and unlike the mean, the quantile is always finite. So this turns out to be sufficient to finally get the exponential rates uh, where the constant in the exponent uh, essentially depends on this, this quantile of how, how many mistakes, uh, how long before it stops making mistakes. Okay, um, so right, what we've covered so far is the distinction between exponential versus linear rates. Um, now I'll just briefly explain an analogous result for the distinction between linear rates versus arbitrarily slow rates. Uh, this part is quite a bit more complicated, but it's really interesting how the same ideas come up here, except now in a kind of a model selection component. Um, so, right, S, S was true in the exponential case. Um, there's also a structure that determines whether or not linear rates are achievable. We call this an, a VCL tree, and it really combines elements of little stone trees and the VC dimension. Um, I'll just explain it with the picture here. Um, it's a tree just like before, where the root is a point that can be labeled either zero or one with classifiers in the class. Um, but then at the next layer, the children of that um, will have two points for each node. And uh, we need to be able to label them in all four possible ways while keeping the label that we chose for the root um, as a constraint. And then for each of those four label patterns, there's a child of that node that has three points in it. And we need to be able to realize all eight possible patterns uh, while keeping the constraints from all of the previous 
uh, edges along the path. So, so um, this continues on with nodes at level K having K points in, uh, uh, associated with them and uh, two to the K uh, children of them corresponding to the two to the K different labelings. And, and for such a tree to be witnessed by the class H, we, what we want is all finite depth paths to uh, be realizable by um, the concept class H. Okay, uh, so that's the definition of an infinite VCL tree. Um, and what we show is that uh, this is the structure that determines the distinction between linear rates and arbitrarily slow rates. Formally, we show a concept class H is learnable at rate one over N if and only if it has no infinite VCL tree. Uh, otherwise, H requires arbitrarily slow rates. So this combined with the other uh, result really complete the, the, the uh, trichotomy. Okay, um, so I'll give a, a high level description of how this proof works in relation to the, uh, the proof for the exponential rates. Um, so similar to the exponential rates case, the, the proof uh, of linear rates is based on a winning strategy to a certain Gale Stewart game. Uh, but in this case, the Gale Stewart game represents, it, it's used in a kind of a model selection component where in a certain sense, we're trying to find a VC class for which the distribution P is realizable. Um, and then uh, we could use a, a learning algorithm for that class to get the one over end rate. It's actually somewhat more nuanced than that, um, but this, this is the basic idea, um, right? In slightly more detail, um, on each round K of this Gale Stewart game, player A proposes K points and player B proposes K binary labels for them. And as before, B wins if there are no concepts left that are consistent with all of these XY pairs from past rounds plus the K new points. Um, if there's no infinite BCL tree, then B will have a winning strategy and we can use this to find a value of k and a function g such that for every k tuple in the data, g proposes k labels that definitely won't all be observed in the data. Um, but if every k points have a label pattern that won't be observed, this is a lot like having VC dimension k minus one or at most k minus one. Um, right, so it's saying you can't witness all two to the k possible labelings of, like there, there are no K points that have all two to the K possible labelings. So that's a lot like having VC dimension at most K minus one. And indeed there's a way to use this property to, uh, to get a bound that's roughly K minus one over N. Um, but then uh, we, we still need to do, uh, we still need to worry about the fact that this uh, K is a random variable and it, it, it's an unbounded, potentially unbounded random variable. So um, we're gonna also have to do this uh, uh, data splitting and voting as before um, to account for this fact. And, and then this leads to an expected error that converges at a one over N rate where the constant factor essentially depends on the quantile of this random variable K. So that's the, the one slide summary of how that proof works. Um, and as I said, the, the details uh, actually get uh, somewhat more involved, but uh, I'll just refer you to the paper for that. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we've established a fundamental trichotomy of universal convergence rates. Uh, for every concept class, it can be learnable at optimal rate that is exponential at optimal rate that is linear or can require arbitrarily slow rates. And these are the only options. Um, we also characterized precisely which classes are in which category, uh, namely uh, a class is learnable at an exponential rate if and only if it has no infinite little stone tree. And a class is learnable at a linear rate if and only if it has no infinite VCL tree.
Thanks.